Can you hear? Or could the no? Okay, just one second. No, no, it's not not working out very well, Ashwika. It's uh, it's I think it's a bandwidth issue and uh, Zoom is not well cut out for videos. So you'll have to show us slides or speak about it. I suppose. Okay, fine. So you all can't you all can't see this at all, can you? We, we can we can see it, but the sound is not clear and uh, the screens are uh, like a series of photos more than a video. Okay. Yeah, I'm a fan. I follow you on Facebook and I get always tweets on Twitter. It was a picture having the investor on board. Okay, so Africa. you can't hear that. Yeah. Uh, you can show the video and we can you can talk through the video rather than the audio maybe. Okay, fine. Good suggestion. Let me do that. Let's try that again. Okay, so as somebody suggested, I'll talk through the video. Uh, now, Sirocco is an absolute, uh, so this particular bird, Sirocco, he's not a normal kakapo because he actually thinks he's a person. And he's such a funny character that one thing sort of led to another when, um, you know, when uh, researchers sort of encountered him. And uh, eventually what happened was he became such a rage. His behavior was so funny and so, uh, you know, unusual that uh, he became an absolute internet celebrity. And today he is the only bird in the world with a government job. The government of New Zealand took advantage of his uh, celebrity status and actually gave him a government job. So he flies around the world on an air, I mean, he flies around all of New Zealand in an airplane, engaging with the public, and he's the official ambassador for conservation in New Zealand. So he's a parrot with a government job. You'll see him in a second. I think that's subtitled. It's a 60 minute drive to his five star high security accommodation where he can finally drop his down. Eat his excellency. Not him, but parrot. Sirocco is a very rare bird, a carpenter. It's a privilege to see him in broad daylight because he's not tame. He's trying to take some time to. Right. Um... That's just a glimpse of Sudoku. The reason that I actually showed you this is because this is a film. Uh, I have somebody here saying others except Ashwika can turn the video off. No, please don't turn your video off. I like seeing your faces. It's good. Otherwise, I feel like I'm talking to myself. Um, yeah. So, hi. <laughs> Bye. Everybody's come back. Good. Uh, so yeah, so the thing is, yeah, so the reason I showed you Sirocco was because this was a film that eventually, I mean, I never, of course, initially intended it to be like that. I mean, I was just making it and I was making it with all my, with all my sort of uh, effort and uh, making it, having a lot of fun. But eventually it ended up resonating with a lot of people starting from the age of eight to eight. And I realized only in hindsight why that happened. It happened because it had a story. And even now, I have kids coming up to me sometimes and, I, and they say, you know, hi, baby, uh, how's the parrot? How's Sirocco doing? They remember, they're eight, they're nine. They saw it when they were five, you know, two, three, four years ago, they saw it. And they still remember. And they say, does he still take the flight? Does he, does he you know, is he still doing this? And he's still doing that? And uh, do you talk to him and silly things like that? But the reason that they actually do that, they remember that. And you know, these are kids that watch Animal Planet all the time. We are kids that watch Discovery Channel all the time. And it's absolutely uh, oversaturation, let's put it that way, of, of very good content on these channels. And I'm not putting that down, that's fantastic. But a lot of the times what happens with documentary filmmaking, even the really good ones, is that it comes down eventually to very, very good footage. But the storytelling is not memorable. 
So the first and utmost top rule, I would say, of science communication, especially natural history filmmaking, is the storytelling aspect. And uh, that's the reason that I first showed it. Now, for me to first, oh, now what I'm going to do is I wanted to show you some other stuff. I'm going to put down a link here. Uh, I'm going to put a link here for you to watch later. This is a this is one of the first sequences I directed uh, a, couple, a couple of years ago for Animal Planet and Discovery. At the moment, it's on much to my shock. I filmed and directed it by myself, and it was just like much to my shock. It's on 11 million views at the moment. So it's something that I like sharing. Uh, I'll, se I'll send you the link because I don't think that you can quite uh, see what I'm sharing at the moment because of bandwidth issues. So just give you a second. So this is one of the little uh, clips that I'd like you to. Uh, oh, I said I shared it with all this. Sorry, sorry, everyone. Yeah, so that's one of the little clips of something else that you can watch later that I worked on, and it's quite a little and entertaining video, and you'll also see why uh, there's a very heartwarming story behind it, and that's the kind of thing that I like working on. I like working on stuff that's, uh, you know, you can actually turn into a story. Now, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk a little bit about science communication and what, how you can turn scientific subjects, especially, um, especially uh, natural history and conservation, into good storytelling. So I can do this in two ways. Either I can go ahead, or I'd like you to I'd like you to start asking questions because there are a lot of people here who are from very different background. Uh, there'll be conservationists who want to know more. There'll be photographers who want to know more, students, etc. So it'll be easiest if you can type your question out and I can uh, sort of uh, address them one by one. So you're most welcome to ask if you want to know. If there are no questions, I will continue to talk about how science communication works. And when you're, somebody is already written, what are the animal well-being implications of birth? I guess. Oh, bird being transported in an airplane. Uh, oh my God, they have all kinds of safety measures for, for, for Sirocco. So he's got his own, you know, very, very protective box and he has his own seat belt on the airplane and the pilot makes sure he gets like first class. So safety measures with Sirocco are as much as the prime minister of New Zealand. So, which is why I want to share that thing with you. It's a very unique story. You must look him up. Um, yeah. Basics of good time. Exactly. Start up the conversation or go, what do you say? Yeah, okay. So, all right. So, there isn't too many people who are initially like novels being converted. Is it possible to convert a conservation social science research paper into screenplay for documentary short film? Very good question. Exactly what I want to say. Now, the first thing about science communication and storytelling is the most important thing. Now, this goes out to everybody. This goes out to people who are um, conservationists. This goes out to people who are, you know, sort of um, students, who are photographers, who are filmmakers, everyone. The most important thing in any, any communication, really, who is your audience? This is the most important question you're going to answer to yourself. Unless you actually know who you're talking to, you're not going to be able to sort of package it in a way that is going to communicate it properly as well. Now, for example, say you are working on a scientific subject and you are studying, like I'm sure Piyasha is here somewhere, she studies fish and cats. Now, if she is wanting to like, sort of talk about her research and turn it into a into a piece of documentary uh, for uh, other scientists, then she'll make it in a certain way. If she's trying to do it for children, then she'll make it in a certain way. So the first question that you always want to ask yourself, and that will first be the first thing that is going to um, shape the way you communicate your subject. That's the first thing. Um, now, sometimes, now, how much is this across? Um, Okay, so sometimes, have you been in a situation where uh, uh, somebody's been talking about something that they're very passionate about? They're talking about a subject that they're very, very passionate about. It could be about history, could be about fashion, could be about world politics, could be any of that. Music, classical music, anything like that. And they're talking very passionately about it. And somewhere along the line, you feel like you're listening, you're listening, you're listening, and then you suddenly lose track of what they're saying. And before you know it, 
you have no idea what they're saying and you're beginning to feel a little bit dumb because you don't know what they're saying and you know they've lost you uh it's very easy to feel guilty when you don't understand something because we like understanding it makes us feel silly when we don't understand something but to be really honest with you if you don't understand something it's less your fault and more the fault of the person who's communicating so when you're doing science communication that's the first thing to keep in mind the first thing to keep in mind is is the other person understanding what i'm saying and that is the soul of science communication is the other person understanding what i am saying um now first thing for that of course like i said was to understand your audience now once you've sort of understood the audience you've also got to um can i can i just uh, stop the questions for a second because uh, there are a lot of questions coming i'll come back to that in a second <laughs> to do when you are uh, sort of talking from the point of view of a scientist or anything anyway. now the first thing that i normally do uh, when i'm working with a scientist or i'm working with uh, a researcher or somebody a conservationist who's really sort of desperate to want to reach the story out the first thing that i do is tell them look assume nobody cares that's the best place to start with science communication nobody cares you want to save a special species of um, uh, salamander somewhere oh my god it's it's 250 million years old it's a living fossil amazing clap 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 regular audience does not care so when you assume that nobody can nobody really is interested in what you want to say then you put that much more extra effort into it, be able to package it in a way that will and that is once somebody's uh, audio is on uh, i can hear you somebody's audio is on is causing a lot of disturbance on my uh, devashish sir can you please mute your microphone sorry those who are not speaking can you put put yourself some mute please okay so that's the first you got to understand what is it about this thing that is going to appeal and what is it not going to appeal now shujan has asked a very interesting question how do you get inspired about a story what attracts you to one now that is the thing when you're working with a scientist the most important thing is to listen to the whole story from them first and understand from that entire picture what part of that as an audience would you like to hear every single subject as a science communicator i will tell you this every single subject has the potential of turning into a story and being communicated i'll give you an example of a film that i had done a couple of years ago on a very very tiny species of frog so small that the newborn frogs can fit into a single drop of rain they're called the xmas frogs and they live nowhere else except in shillong and i was approached by a scientist who said look i want to make a film on these frogs and uh, you know can you please help me out now normally i don't turn down uh, i don't turn down conservation approaches like this because i know how important it is to be able to 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 for scientists to be able to communicate these stories especially the ones that don't get prime time tiger type sort of uh, you know uh, sort of prime time bollywood style uh, uh, screen time on tv like smaller frogs now the thing is when i went uh, when i came across this particular frog species in shillong and i did my research on it i was in a dilemma because i was like oh my god who is going to care about this because it is a tiny brown frog that frankly looked like a bird dropping it looked nothing it was not fluffy it was not cute it was not it had no miraculous amazing behavior it did nothing that was out of the box so how was i supposed to tell a story when uh, it wasn't a, a red panda that was you know automatically cute or it wasn't a baby elephant that was going to melt your heart uh, it was a tiny brown frog that looked like a bird dropping so what i did at that point of time i said okay where is it it's in shillong right so it's a very small frog that lives in a very big city then i spoke to the scientist i worked with him a bit i said who do you really want to make this for are you making this for um uh, other scientists are you doing for fundraising or are you making it for awareness he said mostly for awareness with students so i said children he said yes children i said that's fantastic then let's do something let's call this little frog thumbelina 
And let's have the story of a tiny frog in a big city looking for her frog prince. And uh, it's all about this one tiny frog that is in a big city trying to find a mate and how all these problems in the city sort of come in her way and how eventually she has to overcome all these challenges of a big fat city and she's tiny and this big adventure of a really small frog in a big city and eventually does she or does she not find her her frog prince does she or does she not meet so what we did with something that was really really boring and really really mundane was turn it into a story that caused empathy and caused resonated with the audience especially with children and it became something memorable now i'll give you the flip side to it i could have done it in a slightly uh, different way uh, what i could have done was uh, i could have said look these frogs are in shillong they look like this they're a very special species they've been around for millions of years it's very important to conserve them they are disappearing and we should not let them disappear we should not destroy their land all that i could have given a lot of lecture lot of lecture lot of lecture in it nobody would have remembered it but as soon as you underpin it with a good story as soon as you give it a character a plot a conflict a, a some action and a beautiful resolution automatically that piece of science that is communicated as a story becomes memorable so um i that's why i mean uh, that's what yeah. i would say attracts me about science communication somebody is drawing on yeah ashwik ashwika yeah uh i just uh, two minutes i, I think someone someone else is uh, mistakenly sharing the screen because we can't see you so is that swetha pal or swetha pai right so i want to take over hello <laughs> you can uh, do the session if you want no yeah okay if she doesn't want to take over i'm going to continue okay yeah so okay. yeah so to answer shujanda's question uh, i think that i don't i mean of course there are many 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 subjects that naturally lend themselves to stories like sirocco automatically lent himself to a story some things come very naturally but the challenge is sometimes and the exciting part is sometimes to be able to find that story in something that is mundane and that is such fun because then you're like okay uh the you know regular tv will not pick this up this is a really hard subject it's my challenge is to how i'm going to make people care and i normally usually test it on my friends and my family who have nothing to do with wildlife and cannot sort of never sit and watch animal planet they have nothing to do with anything so i test it on them if they understand it and they like it that means it's going somewhere so yeah so that's the second thing um the other thing that about science communication now this is really important for people who are scientists here and who are experts here it's really really important to cut the jargon now it's very easy for us to assume that what we say as experts uh words we use concepts we talk about is public knowledge it's not you will be surprised how little uh people actually understand very you know of of environmental terms and uh, natural history terms and other scientific terms like for example if you say if you call uh, you know if you say mollusk instead of snail people will not understand if you say bioluminescence it's fine unless I, i mean it's fine if you explained it but if you just say it you'll be surprised how little the audience actually picks up on that and this is not to say that you need to understand the audience this is not to say that you need to patronize the audience but you have to understand exactly how much the audience understands or not and as scientists sometimes uh, have a reputation of turning something quite simple into quite complicated and that is the opposite of good science communication it's about being able to explain what you're doing very simply and very cleanly and cut out the extra jargon sometimes when you have to cut out the extra jargon a really good way of science communication is to use a metaphor like for example say you're researching fleas and you're trying to explain to children why fleas are cool now a flea i believe can uh i think uh, jump some thousand times their their height or something like that it's i don't exactly remember the exact uh uh number for it but flea can jump some thousand times its height or something like that 
which translates to human beings. Uh, it translates to, for example, you being able to jump over the Eiffel Tower. So when you're trying to show something like a dung beetle, which is really, really strong, how do you explain how strong the dung beetle is to somebody who doesn't, who is not a scientist person, right? To a regular audience. You say, okay, so, you know, dung beetle can roll 11,000, 1100 times their own body weight. What does that mean? That basically means it's like you dragging 10 buses along with you. Now that's pretty strong. So metaphors is a really good way of doing it. In replacement or in view of the jargon, when you're trying to explain something, a very good way of doing it. And you see the best sort of storytellers, you know, are always sort of explaining, they always say, you know, like, etc. So it's always really nice to, to cultivate that skill of using a metaphor. The other thing that I've always sort of uh, uh, noticed about science communication, especially working with scientists and working with uh, experts, it's always, and this is something that happens even with filmmakers, you are very attached to your work. You're very attached to your work and the amount of research you've done. Now you've done five years worth of research, fantastic. There's a lot there, but it's very important when you're doing your science communication to choose what you want to communicate. And in filmmaking, in Science filmmaking language, an uh, ex-professor of mine used to put it very well, it's about killing your darlings, which means if you're too attached to everything that you want to, you, that you've worked on, then what happens in that entire picture by trying to say everything, you end up saying nothing. So when you are communicating a subject, suppose you are working on a particular bird species and you're trying to talk about, uh, uh, say, hondles and their nesting, hypothetically. If you now start talking about other stuff about that species and everything else and conservation and this, that and the other, then what happens is in that, in that uh, sort of attempt to pack everything in or listen to everything I want to say, you don't end up communicating any of it. So one of the major, most important things about science communication that you have to remember, whether you're doing it yourself or you're working with somebody who is helping you communicate, is to be very, ask yourself very clearly what aspect of what I'm talking about do I want to communicate? Do I need to tell the audience everything? Do I need to tell them about every last bit of data that I found? Do I need to put in 20 interviews in it because you know they've helped me? So you know their face should be there talking in the in the in the film. Because you're not making this film for yourself, you're making it for the audience, and you have to realize what the audience will listen to. So if you are going to say, ah, you know, I worked with this person for three years, I should put in one, one, door, one interview of this person. You've got to understand, is the audience going to be interested? If the audience is not interested, then that interview is pointless. Then you're flattering that person. Does that interview contribute to your storyline? Does it contribute to what you're trying to communicate? Then yes. I'm sorry, it's being cruel, but it's true. It's very true. You have to be able to choose. And the more you streamline what you want to communicate, the better that piece of science communication, whether documentary, whether writing, whether photography, whether anything else, that aspect, the more you streamline, the better, because the hardest thing and the simplest thing to achieve is simplicity. The more simple it is, the better. Better. Less is always more, always more. So that's a very important thing to get to the And I find that uh, sort of uh, something that is harder uh, so do, it becomes it's a, it's a hard practice actually because you know even when we're making films and I make films sometimes I'm so attached imagine if I waited one week for one footage like okay I'm going to show you something this is um I'm going to show you a little something uh now I was in the Sundarbans working on a bunch of films recently and one of the films I was working on was on mudskippers now I'm sure most of you know what a mudskipper is they live obviously in, in the thick of mud so I had to I was with um another friend of mine who's here right now, Shubha Jyoti, and the two of us were filming uh, Mud Skippers, and I had to literally take my camera, which was like, you know, heavy, huge, bloody thing. I had to take this, wait through mud, which was waist deep, and sit submerged in that mud for eight, nine hours every day, while midges completely killed me, eating me alive. But I had to sit there quietly, filming a macro species, two feet away from it, as still as possible, without moving, with my chair embedded inside this mud, whole day sitting like that. And I waited hours and days, and my whole leg was full of insect bites, and my leg used to fall asleep. And I'll just show you something, like, I think I'll show you a little, I think it's there somewhere, I'm not sure. Uh, this is what my office normally looks like. 
Can you see this? Hopefully. Yeah, so pretty much like that. And like that for eight hours in the whole day. And look, my leg is inside. And I'm just sitting there for whole day. The reason why I'm saying this is I was talking about killing your darlings. Now, after sitting like that and suffering so much, trust me, it was the hardest, one of the hardest shoots I've ever done. Because just sitting like that inside mud for nine, ten hours is not a joke. Every day for a week. And uh, after that, when I came back to the edit and I saw some of the shots, I was really tempted to put it into the film because I had put in so much effort into it but it just didn't fit the story. There were certain shots that I had waited for for so long, got the shots, they were good shots, but it didn't fit into the story. And then I realized that I had suffered three, probably three days waiting for that shot, but it did not contribute to my narrative and it did not enhance what I was going to, the film that I was making, which is still not released, it will release quite soon, uh, you will see it. And uh, it did not. So at some point, I had to make this really cruel decision saying, forget it, even if I suffered because of it, and even if I'm really attached to this shot, if it's not going to contribute to my science communication exercise, then I'm not going to put it. So similarly, if you're a scientist, a zoologist, a conservationist, and you're trying to, and you want to communicate an aspect, a very important aspect of your, uh, of, of your research, say you want to communicate the habitat loss aspect, but you really got very good footage of something else, of like mating shots of something or, or breeding shots. But it's not contributing to your narrative. You have to learn how to sacrifice it. You have to learn how to sacrifice that interview. So it's very important to, again, streamline. Um, now, now I'm going to sacrifice the question and come back to storytelling, a bit of what storytelling really means. Now I'm going to go up. Um, Challenges of wildlife filmmaking, somebody asked. Well, there are many, I've already highlighted a few. Uh, like I said, the mental tenacity you need is more than the physical tenacity. It's about strength up here rather than strength here. Strength here is also needed, but um, more strength here than there. So I've already covered that a bit, so I'm gonna move on uh, Yeah, Are you accompanying a vet as well shooting? Very good question. So I'm not accompanying, usually accompany a vet. A uh, vet is somebody who cures animals, unless of course I'm working on that sort of a subject. Uh, but in most cases, in 99% cases, I work, science, commun science communicators always work very closely with scientists. So the scientist is your, is your Google, is your so source of information. You are communicating it on behalf of the scientist. So if I'm going to be working on a particular subject, I I'll work very close. Say if I'm working on uh, uh, rock pool animals or animals in an intertidal zone. Then I'll work very closely with a marine biologist who's going to be able to interpret a lot of the stuff, is going to be able to give me all that information. And then I will take all that information and say, look, this is what I feel like the story is. What else can we do with this? Do you think you'll get behavior like that? So you always work very closely with the scientist. The closer you work with the scientist, the more correct your information and the more correct your information, the better your film or your piece of science communication, whatever the format may be. So yes, to answer your question, we work very closely with scientists. So we don't just um, depend on internet research. We read science papers. We a lot, even though I don't actually come from a science background, I come from a literature background, a storytelling background. I read a lot of science papers, a lot of zoology papers. Research is really important. And working with a scientist is very important. Uh, Didi, are there any good books to start reading on natural history for kids? Uh, I don't immediately have the answer to that for kids, um, but um, I'll look it up and I will just drop me a line on my email on Facebook. I'll send you. How do you guys find your film? What tracks you? Okay, you have to You got to do production of films. No, I don't do still photography. I only do filmmaking. I started with still photography, but I transitioned into filmmaking. What kind of ethics do you maintain during wildlife filmmaking? Okay, that's a really good uh, uh, point uh, that you made. Uh, see, the thing is with ethics, it's a, it's a, it's a, okay, let's put it this way. It's a gray area. So what happens is, first of all, there's the law. The law itself puts down a bunch of rules for scheduled animals. Scheduled animals are protected animals in India, which puts down a bunch of laws. That means you can't uh, disturb it in its natural habitat. You can't bait it. You can't uh, sort of... Um, you know, do a bunch of like, you can't disturb a nest of a certain, you know, 
a bird, whatever it is. So there's a bunch of rules. You can't uh, capture it. You can't entrap it. You can't do those things. So those are rules that are already. You can't take it out of its habitat and take it somewhere else. These are scheduled animals. So scheduled animals already have rules put down by the law. So anything that sort of breaks that rule is playing on bad ethics. Number one. But the real gray area comes when you are working with animals that don't fall under the scheduled species. That's where your judgment comes into play. For example, a lot of the times for very big uh, natural history productions that are macro that work with very small animals, spiders, etc., they create these elaborate, massive sets, and they do a lot of stuff in tank filming. But the environment within that tank, that huge, huge tank, is almost like the wild. So that's the kind, like that's something that BBC has done many times. That's something National Geographic has done many times. Now, where is the ethic there? It's a very interesting question. The point is, if in whatever circumstance the animal itself is comfortable and the animal itself is not being harmed, you've got to ask yourself that question: Am I pushing the line too much? Have I gone too close? Am I endangering this animal? Am I uh, risking its death? Am I risking stressing it out? Am I too close to this nest? So you could ask yourself that question when it comes to non-scheduled animals, whether something that you're doing when you work with uh, when you work with big productions on on things that are like tank filming and stuff like that, you work very closely with scientists again so that the animals <laughs> itself are always in an environment closest to the wild. And they are healthy, and they are well looked after. So that's to answer your question. I think it comes down to two things. One is the law, and secondly, personally, you've got to keep asking yourself whether this is harming the animal. If, it, if the answer comes back no, I mean, answer comes back yes, you are. You need to step back. It's as simple as that. Uh, let me. This document did not. Uh, I would like to make a document on all the national parks in India. uh with it's like you want somebody here said something like i want to make a documentary on all the national parks in india uh especially for and for one of these places okay uh see that's again a very difficult thing to do because all the national parks in india is a lot of national parks so how are you going to tie it together so for example i'll give you an example of uh you know the series that i had presented a few months ago for discovery channel that was also on six top sort of places in india conservation but that but the central theme that ran through it was forest guards how forest guards look after these places so when you're trying to make something as sweeping and as big as sort of all the national parks in india you've got to ask yourself uh, how am i going to link all of them to one link that sort of ties these places together. So, if you're going to do all the national parks, then that's going to become never-ending. So, like I said, it's that's where you kill your darlings and you choose the top six national parks you want to work with. Maybe the coldest, or maybe the hottest, or maybe uh, the most remote. So, maybe your angle is most extreme in there, or something like that. So, you have to find a way of being able to tie it together. That's the that's the key. Uh, Can you mention some challenges you face as a woman, especially in early part of your career? Very yes, yes. Oh my God! So uh, initially, when I first said I want to be a wildlife filmmaker, people were like, "Ha, huh. yeah, okay then. Uh, you're not exactly 45 years old, male, big, tall man with a big hat and camouflage clothing, and you know, pockets everywhere and looking all tough. So like, this can't be for you." So initially, people were very skeptical and. Um, uh i faced a lot of uh, doubt from even officials forest wise and there was actually one man who was quite funny he asked me he saw my work and he said uh ye aapne banaya hai and i said ha he saw my film and i said ha so he said acha aap camera chala lete hain and i was like ha chala leti hu acha aap camera utha leti hain so it was just a nightmare in the big so it i had to like literally tell people yes i can lift a camera i can make a film i know okay. i'm a girl so but after that what happens is initially there are challenges always but the real the real thing is to remember at the end of the day your work will speak for you you don't have to worry about that if your work is up to scratch your work will speak for you and that is going to take a little bit longer if you are not if you don't fall into the box let's put it that way but eventually it will work out 
so don't let that uh, hold you back in fact just laugh it off so yeah um can you please something something i want a conversation with like in mainstream bollywood you think is a good point uh because they make very bad very very bad conservation films have you there's something i saw i don't remember this but there was a nightmare film i saw on the sundarbans um, i didn't see the whole film but it was some film i don't know if anybody can remember you can put it down in the chat but they just it's just a matter of i don't know bollywood's never managed to actually communicate wildlife uh in a in a correct way and that's largely because they sensationalize it uh, they don't underpin it with uh, they don't underpin it with science none of it is really underpinned with science you know babi phone chalu ha phone somebody is talking no somebody is no 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 mute your uh, to khatri you need to mute yourself okay uh yeah so bollywood yeah bollywood is quite a failure when it comes to that how was it working um with sir david attenborough i think it was my greatest uh dream come true in fact i'm again working on a documentary with him right now as we speak and it is absolutely the absolute dream come true because it was i mean i was 29 he was 92 what were the chances that our careers would ever have overlapped and you know i it it was it just happened in a way that it was miraculous and they say sometimes don't meet your heroes but whoever they are they are wrong because he is um, as wonderful and as humble and as knowledgeable and as kind and nice as you would imagine him to be he's just fantastic so yeah i think that has been really uh, the most uh, sort of uh, special uh, experience that i've had uh, in my career so far Do you tweak the story a bit, or will you be uh, use actual facts? Act, what actual facts about the absolutely? You will never tweak. I mean, you will have to. I mean, you can base it on. Fa- what I mean is, um, you always it's always based on fact. You don't make up fiction. It's based on fact. But of course, for example, say you're shooting ants, okay, and you're shooting uh, this uh, one ant sort of carrying or whatever two ants carrying this leaf and walking off, okay. you are let's be really honest in a wildlife film that's not going to when you're showing that same shot of the ant from three different directions it's not the same ant it's definitely not it's obviously two or three different ants that you shot carrying the leaf and you've cut it together so the truth of the matter is the ant is carrying the leaf to its de- uh, to its nest but of course there is going to be a little bit of creative liberty that you have to take because you're not going to be able to follow and the same ant no so there is that aspect also whether this is fact or fiction but that is you have to be able to that's with any storytelling you have to uh for example you're following a scientist who's going into the field to do some work and that's part of your story and you say okay you followed it in live and then you say okay listen we need to go back and get some pick up shots of you which means that you know i need to get you getting into the car i need to get you getting out of the car i need you to sort of look through some paperwork that you've been doing you are recreating things to be able to tell the story so obviously there is that aspect of being able to take those extra shots just to build on the story but the science always has to be factual that is the most important thing the science has to be factual which is why you work closely with scientists as a science communicator always um fascinating talk thank you very much uh, do you tweak the story blah 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 uh, kuda you are most welcome to tweet mm. <laughs> i hate i'm afraid of lizards how do you overcome this um okay this is a very strange question but i'm going to take it do you have a laser pointer you should you, normally my my cousin is very scared of lizards i normally point the laser point he and she points the laser point in front of it and guides it slowly out of the window they follow the laser pointer so you can gently make it leave your room without hurting it or it won't hurt you anyway so yeah um have you worked with dr anish andhiri uh, not directly but i know him and he's fantastic and he was one of the supporters of the discovery show that i had presented he's really really knowledgeable uh tell us about shoot uh, ended up with tell us about shoot which ended up in a total mess just to john that asked me terrible question i knew he was here to do this to sabotage my talk okay this is true but you know because what happens is a lot of people ask me this question how do wildlife films how do you do wildlife films does the script come first what happens 
so the most important thing really sometimes is the research really all the time actually you first do your research really well etc and you go into the field knowing your research really well because then you don't waste your time trying to figure it out in the field you already know what the behavior is but of course animals have this um rather annoying tendency not to follow scripts um so when you've done your research and made a first initial shooting script you end up in the field uh and of course your animals have decided not to follow the script so there was um there have been uh, there have been many 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 occasions where the shoot has ended up in a total mess one was um up in uh, kashmir when i was filming uh, black bears and uh, it was the perfect time of the year for them to come into the valley to feed on acorns just before the before the uh, winter and they were all you know the research was correct the timing was correct everything was correct and we landed up and we didn't see any bears and we were like oh my god the scientists have been telling us this is the time to go the weather is perfect the acorns are ripe where are the bears and uh, we waited 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 for two three weeks etc and then one day we just said look we are just spending too much money we'll have to just ask the forest guards on location to be able to tell us when they come down and we're going to go away and we're going to come back when they're back and it started raining a lot the day that we decided to leave so we left and we came back and uh, to delhi from kashmir and that evening uh, it was all over the news that uh, the greatest floods in 100 years had struck kashmir and it was so strange because the bears very oddly enough had chosen not to come down to the valley at all i couldn't help but wonder whether they were more in sync with nature than we were and they chose that year just not to come down to the valley at the time that they're normally supposed to and the greatest floods hit that year so talk about big messes yes uh, it could have been a bigger mess we could have got stuck there and that shoot was a delightful failure and but we went and got it again next year So yeah, so things don't always go the way you plan with wildlife. Uh, have you gone to buses? Have you ever gone to buses? Have you captured photos? Uh, yeah, they do the animals all the time. You can't take permission, but you do it. Uh, have I been attacked by animal during a project? No, I haven't really been attacked, but uh, somebody goes to all kinds of disasters. I once brought almost brought a baby Russell Viper home in the base plate of my camera. It had climbed into the base plate of my camera, and I didn't know it was there. And I was happily almost brought it home until I noticed that there was something poking out. And of all things, it had to be a baby Russell Viper. So, yeah, the fact that I'm sitting here talking to you means I'm got nine lives or something. Um, yeah, we always face dangerous situations during work, but it's very important to know. there's a very fine line in natural history filmmaking between bravery and stupidity and you have to know the very fine line uh, especially when you're in the wild and uh, again that comes down to listening to scientists listening to local knowledge listening to your guides if they tell you not to do something don't do it if they know best they are there um, so yes but there are many times there are dangerous situations that you can't sort of predict but it's very very important to not put yourself in danger by actually listening to the people who understand that landscape best so if somebody says don't run when you know something happens or something's chasing you they say don't run stand your ground and do that or they say run now you run or whatever it is or they say don't go any closer than this or we won't go down this path because it's not dang it's dangerous you can't bend that rule because that's life or death um <laughs> or road the tiger sundarban yeah that's the nightmare scene damn uh what are the experiences in the industry i'm planning actually do you see any possibility of indian production like that in near future reaching common people absolutely it is just so annoying because what happens with india is most of the times the animal planet and nature etc doesn't commission too much so most of the commissions come from abroad so we don't have our i mean we do now we are beginning to have it slowly one or two platforms are coming up there's a really good platform called round glass that's come up there's a num number of other platforms that are coming up now slowly of uh, science communication and sort of natural history film making but very few platforms are home grown in india for for science communication natural history they're very dependent on foreign funding which is not great i mean which is bad because then our all our stories don't get told so you know but you know then again there's the internet now so yeah it's a good platform for everyone 
sort of level playing field. Um, uh, how was your experience shooting in North Bengal? North Bengal is very place very close to my heart. I've grown up practically there because my dad was in tea for many many years, and I spent a lot of time in the tea garden. So uh, I grew up there and large not not didn't live there, but I went there a lot of times in the year. And so North Bengal is very very close to my heart, and it was absolutely fantastic always going back because. You know, a lot of people talk about North Bengal being a conflict zone with elephants, etc. But uh, as I sort of got more into it, especially in this last series that I worked on with Anil Planet, the more I went into it, I realized it was more a landscape of tolerance than of conflict. There is conflict, but there is immense tolerance in North Bengal. There's a lot of compassion and a lot of tolerance, and there's a lot of coexistence. So it's a it's a landscape you can learn a lot from. It's a very humbling landscape where man and animal share a space. There is conflict, but it is a level playing field in many ways, and there is also a lot of tolerance. So there's a lot to learn from North Bengal. A lot. Really. Uh, what type of animals do you like to shoot? I have no discretion. I find uh, leopard cubs as cute as baby frogs. Uh, so I have no discretion. It's terrible. I find everything adorable when it comes to the natural world. Uh, so no, I uh, I mean there's no preference that way. A new subject that is challenging that gives me the opportunity to be able to tell a creative story. That's fun. Um, something that has been done and done and done and done that I don't find so much excitement. And like I know a lot of people here are going to get very upset, but tigers, for example, done, 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 done. I will much rather uh, film some an unknown species that nobody knows about than follow that same. Tiger story again. So, yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about conservation work? In last year, grassroot conservation work. Now, um, I do a lot of uh, well. I, I, in between my my job, which is science communication and national history filmmaking, whenever I am in town and I'm able to, I uh, am with this organization called Heal, which is right now hosting uh, this. And uh, you know, Heal taught me something very important. He taught me that, like charity, conservation also starts at home. And the more, pe more people that are able to do conservation on a very local level, the more people around the world do conservation on a local level, the better it is for the planet. So whenever I am able to, I try and help heal here in Bengal. I've worked in South Bengal with them on um, tribal hunting, on uh, curtailing tri tribal hunting. I've done science communication with children uh, of tribal hunters and it's amazing because you know these children have been taught since they were since they were babies that you know animals are meant to be killed they are meant to be sort of hunted they are there because you want to eat them or they want to kill them and we went i think i have a picture here somewhere one second uh where's that picture yeah there you go so these are like the tribal hunting uh community the children of that community it's not a very flattering picture um uh, yeah so we went once and we tried to do this sort of science communication, not science communication, but sort of a natural history engagement with these children. And what I saw was fascinating, honestly, because what happened was, you know, like I said, these children are normally brought up thinking that all animals are meant to be hunted. They have, they have, they, they're given these uh, catapults since they were kids. They can shoot the bird from one mile away. They are fantastic when it comes to aiming. And they've always been taught that animals are meant to be hunted and eaten and, you know, exploited. But at the same time, when I started talking to them about the natural world and I showed them pictures from Africa and I showed them pictures from Borneo and I showed them orangutans and lions and elephants, they reacted like normal children. They reacted with fascination and wonder. And they said, you know, I would say, what animal is this? And they said, giraffe. And they were like, zebra. And they knew all the names. And then they asked me the ones that, you know, they didn't know about. And they said, oh, we get this here also. You know, there was a den there. So the thing is with kids, especially with science communication, with kids on a grassroots level, has been such a learning experience because all children, irrespective of background, are always fascinated by nature we somehow lose that fascination and that love for nature as we grow older as we get into adulthood we start losing that connection with nature but all children have that and so talking about grassroots conservation one of the most special things i actually did was work with these kids and really realize that look they actually have it in them to really love nature and before we left at the end of that program they all said you know okay you know we won't uh, 
we'll not kill them and you know they are also part of this our planet and all of that and it's just a matter of being able to inspire it's just a matter of being able to motivate and tell a good story and move people because you know at the end of the day these kids are going to be the future adults and wouldn't it be wonderful to have a environmentally literate world out there isn't it so yeah talking about grassroots conservation also done another a bunch of other things with heel like uh, sting operation exciting and dolphin uh, oil and uh, several other things really and heel does a lot of very good work locally so yeah that's my thing for future shooting any um future are there any more shoot parks that are not covered by me oh my god so many india is full of parks i haven't even i don't think i've even done 50% so yeah loads lots uh into something how do you start what are the basic steps of starting a documentary film this is this see um with i'm going to answer with wildlife in making specifically to be really honest everybody's journey is completely different from the other persons like i use another metaphor it's like finding your way through the forest some people come from a science background some people come from film making background some people come from writing background so it can be anything really the most important skill again i come back to the same thing at the risk of sounding repetitive is to master your storytelling skills if you can master storytelling that's all you need the rest of it the camera and all that those are machines you will learn how to use it the most important is how are you using that machine and how are you telling it to story so the first steps i would say uh practically speaking would say try and do an apprenticeship try and do an internship with someone follow you know uh offer your time uh watch how it's done by one of the professionals uh you may not get paid initially but at least you learn you can learn it as a you can treat it as school really uh how do you manage balance story to facts uh uh keep bringing it up in between ending with facts how does it work how do you manage story with facts the the facts are your backbone of your story you don't balance one with the other you one is born out of the other let's put it that way so the first thing that comes to you are the facts so you've got a paper full of facts and then you have to arrange those facts and see where you, what kind of story you want so for example say you have all these facts about a particular subject now you're like okay i've got all these facts now what angle do i want to take to be able to present these facts i think these facts on their own will be very difficult uh, to visualize so i want to tell it through the point of view of a scientist who's researching it so then the scientist becomes your main character who carries the film forward it's about that say okay say you've got a bunch of facts on sharks okay um on the natural history of sharks the myths around sharks the the conservation around sharks the kind of illegal activity that goes around sharks right so how do you do it you can either present it fact 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 or you can find a story so what's your story maybe you have a really good conservationist out there who's a very good character and she or he knows everything about the species so you say okay she is going to lead my film and she is going to be the point of view through which i will learn about these facts so you have to literally just take those facts first and see what facts you have and then the story is born out of that so one doesn't sort of balance the other one is born out of the other you never compromise on the facts when it comes to science communication because otherwise what's the point it's fiction it's not documentary um have you done a documentary in the western ghats no it's on my bucket list what are the funding for me what are the um I don't understand that question. This could not being able to focus on facts when there is emphasis. Do you run the risk of not being able to focus on facts when there is an emphasis on the story? Um, no, not really, not really, because it, I don't think so. Because again, like I was saying, you've got to understand why you're saying why your 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 point of your communication. in any piece of communication, if you're just trying to pack in the facts, then that's a different sort of a thing. then you're not doing it for communicating to the general public you are not doing it for somebody who doesn't quite understand if you just want to pack in all your facts then that's a presentation it's not a story so everything about okay let's put a different spin on this what else is science communication a museum is science communication correct so when you walk into the dinosaur section in a museum you're fascinated it's amazing right but not everything is listed about that particular dinosaur species now is there because you won't be able to 
get everything in your head about it. So there's this giant, amazing T-Rex that you're completely fascinated about. And there's this amazing audio happening in a museum that you're listening to about dinosaurs and it's fantastic. But if you're told everything and pack in all the facts, then you're not going to get the story correct. So you have to choose which facts are important and then create the story. You don't sacrifice the facts, but you have to categorize them, basically. So if you're going to, a tendency is always there to want to put in everything. But sometimes you've got to choose what is the most important facts that you want to put in. What is the most important message that you want to give out? You don't have to put everything in, really. Um, yeah, do you think there is no need for, uh, need for uh, documentaries in local languages? Absolutely, I totally, and I'm guilty of not doing it. I, I think it's very important. And if we can create translations also, or just dub over or anything like that in local languages, it's very important because look, sometimes you're making these films in a community and say Shundurban, for example, and you're doing the film there. And it's, it's really, it's a good thing to be able to have it in Bengali. Or so that you know, even the local people are engaged. And because, for example, this Matskipa film, uh, at some point, I I do want to sort of translate it also into Bengali because it's nice, no? Because they see it and it's right there in their backyard, and uh, you know, they'll be able to actually engage with their own. Uh, I think it was the first frontline protectors of any um, any sort of uh, protect a uh, forest or any sort of natural place is always the local people. So unless the films really go back to that community and inspire that community, I think you lose out on, on an opportunity if you don't translate it. So yes, absolutely. I think local language is very important. Even if it's not your primary um, sort of film, you should try and make one that is can go back to the community or the surrounding community where you made that film. Um, do some work which can be useful for schooling children about wildlife and rescue of animals. Absolutely, I would. I mean, I work a lot with children and I think it's much nicer and much easier explaining stuff to kids than to sometimes explaining to adults. Because, you know, sometimes I go mad trying to explain climate change to adults who will deny it for the rest of their lives. But children get it like that because they are open minded and they're ready to learn and they're like sponges. So I think it's fantastic to, for all science communicators out there, future now, whenever, always remember something brainwash the kids. The kids are your future. So uh, just brainwash them and make sure that they are on board with you. So, uh, you know, you've got a better chance at protecting uh, the planet later if you've got them on your side. That's the trick. Um, who is a better audience, kids or adults? Uh, that's an unfair question, but honestly, kids are amazing. You know, I'm, uh, they, they just get it, like I was saying. It's, it's really, really... Uh, they're very into it nowadays, especially kids nowadays are very aware. Their parents are not, they are. How do you bring attention on the documentary? Good question. Uh, well, there are many ways now. The most, um, the most uh, sort of uh, easy way now is social media. You've got an advertising platform right there. There are, there are mostly that is the best way of doing it. Um, the other way of doing it is to physically travel with something. So for example, say you have a good documentary that you've made on uh, uh, a species of uh, a, a wildcat species or something. So another way of doing it is to use that documentary as an excuse to also um, sort of talk about conservation at schools, at colleges, stuff like that. So it's physically travel and stuff like that. But how you promote it largely is um, there are many ways, if it's not getting on TV, then it's social media promotions are the way to go now. It's everybody's on social media. So that's really, I would say that's the best way to go. Uh, is there any institute in India for wildlife filmmaking? No, no, there isn't. Um, absolutely not, actually. There's only one or two courses in the world that do this. And um, yeah, that's one is in New Zealand, the one that I did, and there's another one in the UK. So it's quite unfortunate that we don't have one yet. So. Who knows? Uh, hey, Ashwika, uh, this is uh, Orko. Sorry to uh, disrupt you. Uh, originally, this was planned for 60 minutes. So, of course, it has been very interesting and we are now nearing 90 minutes. So, I suppose those who have questions left can ask them in uh, on, the, on, the, on the webinar directly to you. That might save some time. Webinar uh, directly? I have, I have no problems. Whatever you decide, I'm good. 
Does anyone have any questions anyone left for Ashwika? Uh, do you have a dream subject? Shujanda is asking me. Uh, yeah, your birds of paradise. Are you going to take me? <laughs> yes, I do actually. I'd love to film the birds of paradise. So Shujan Chatterjee, this is going to backfire on you. Yeah. Uh, yeah, let's continue. Oh God, can you recommend us some good science communication books? Yes, I can, but I'll need to look up the exact name. So send me again. My email is very safe. Always my name, Ashvika Kapoor at gmail.com. Or you can find me on Facebook and ask me for these recommendations and I'll send you a list. Um, I'm putting my email down here. You can always send me an email. Okay, for all people who want recommendation for books, etc., I can't do the, all of that right now. So I'm going to put my email down here. You're most welcome to send me or on Facebook, whichever on Facebook you can see. Any more questions, or shall we hand over to Orkuda? Do you like to nice, nice playlist of science films? Okay, yeah, definitely can do that. A really good science film outside of wildlife, uh, if you want to watch, uh, because of you know the current subjects of climate change, etc. Uh, watch this film called Age of Stupid. It's a masterpiece in science communication. It's about climate change. Again, fantastic story. It's about this man who is in 2050 looking back at Earth as Earth destroyed itself, basically as man committed mass suicide without paying attention to the natural world. And it's completely based on facts, completely based on reality, but packaged in a way of a story that makes it so interesting. So a really good film to watch is something called Age of Stupid. It's about climate change. It's a really good film. It was made in 2009 or something. So a long time ago, but it's fantastic. Mm. Can you repeat the film, Age of Stupid? Correct. Somebody has written the book. Age of Stupid. Correct. It's a very good film for climate change. And the reason why I gave you that example is because climate change is a very difficult subject to make interesting or concretely visualize. So you have to attach a story to it in a way so that people sort of understand, right? So it was a very successful film because at that point, climate change was not even a subject that people had even begun getting their heads around, global warming and stuff like that. It's about global warming. And uh, yeah, so, you know, they did a remarkable job of actually doing it. That's why I gave you that example. It's a very old film, but it's a very good film. Somebody's seen it. It's an awesome movie. It is. Yeah. Um, more recommendations. I think one of my favorite, uh, one of my absolute favorite. Uh, okay. Uh, another one of my absolute favorite films is a film called uh, uh, Green. It's about, uh, it's a silent film. It has no dialogues and only the visuals tell the story. So that's a very different sort of storytelling. It's about orangutan. Uh, green, uh, green, green, green. It's about orangutans. I think you might find it online. Another fantastic film that came out recently, which is really worth a watch. And again, extremely, extremely sort of, um, uh, one sec, what's it called? Hang on, I'll just check that. Yeah, so something came out quite recently. It's a very recent documentary. It's called Octopus in My House. And it's about this scientist who who sort of uh, experiments with uh, the intelligence of this octopus, but in his house. So it's called Octopus in My House. Again, fantastic storytelling. And you'll see how, uh, what I mean by uh, a flat factual documentary versus something that tells you a fantastic story. So it's a good one. That's quite recent. So I've given you one old, one recent, and one medium old. Octopus in my house, correct. Really, really good film. Fun, really fun. Yeah. Uh, cool. Um, anything? Okay. You're most welcome. Somebody's being very kind. Uh, any projects I'm eagerly waiting to work on? <laughs> yes, many. I really want to work on the elephants in South Bengal. So as and when that happens. 
you know honestly the more i the more i experience all this i kind of feel like uh you know it's very uh, of course you know you have you always everybody has dreams of working with the silverbacks in you know another part of the world and orangutans and stuff but there's just so many amazing stories in our own backyards no matter where you are the stories in your own backyards are so fascinating and you can do that you don't need massive cameras to do that you don't need massive access to do that so i genuinely think you know there's going to be an anti climactic sort of reply but i feel like i want to work more on regional stories and local stories now and i will work on other stuff as well because that's what i do professionally but it gives me a lot of gratification and a lot of satisfaction to also work in my own region in my own sort of place because it gives me the opportunity to highlight things from where i hail so i would encourage everybody who's sort of a photographer zoologist conservationist over here there's so many amazing stories to work on just where you are so i like it you know who else will yeah related to oh. that there is a there is a comment or a question rather rather a comment from abrajol ghosh on facebook live he says mm -hmm. love that you worked on a bush frog for a documentary uh, would love to see more amphibians and reptiles within I brackets know. except king cobra in your documentary i don't know what abrajol has against king cobra Maybe if anything king cobra are like the tigers of the are the tigers of the snake world so they get enough attention i think that's what he's trying to say okay i agree i agree with him i'm i have a major soft i have a major soft fauna for uncharismatic species if you know what i mean so anything that's not naturally charismatic or naturally lends itself to being a sexy subject on a uh, animal planet i have a major soft corner for that because they don't get that attention and then it's a massive it's a fantastic challenge sometimes you know to be able to how do you make something that's not you know a natural hero into a hero and that's the fun part about science so i anyway have a major soft corner for macro and all kinds of smaller species so anybody who's willing to do that i think uh, yeah you're my friend i like that i agree with you already thank you didi you inspired me a lot myself <laughs> all right um any more questions anybody uh, can we call it a day or kuda is there anything more on facebook live that i can address i can't see the facebook live no i think i think uh, you have addressed most of the important questions if there is anything more that comes up on facebook live maybe you can just go into that facebook page and type your reply there at a later time um i i can see one or two coming up in the chat if you want to answer those now or you can answer them over email or something if you if you are running short of time you can do that as well I'm glad. I'm glad a lot of people have enjoyed this. If there's any more questions you have, I've given you my email address. You're also connected with me on Facebook. You can send me a message. Uh, if you've got a particular subject that you are wanting to communicate and you haven't been able to ask that question in detail over here, uh, maybe you are working on a research that you don't know how to sort of present as a communication piece, or you know, or you you are passionate about a subject and you want some. guidance or help with that or uh, you know sort of uh, you want to brainstorm it or whatever you're welcome to write to me on uh, my email or on facebook at any point of time no problem i will i will help in whatever way i can all right thank whatever you thank you whatever the knowledge all of us have we must share it because knowledge kept to yourself is useless that's the bottom line all righty i think on that note um Yeah. So thanks, thanks, Rashika. That was a brilliant talk. Very informative and uh, very inspiring. Uh, I hope we all enjoyed it. Uh, we can, of course, uh, watch uh, this talk on our Facebook page uh, whenever we want to. It's Heal Planet, and on Facebook, and uh, I can share the link on the chat as well. Uh, we will also upload the video on YouTube. And just to remind you, this is our inaugural. Uh, webinar of the series conservation for women uh, we have uh, six more webinars to um, follow after this the next one is by dia banerji who is a wildlife conservationist and activist she is going to be speaking about uh, citizen science and conservation on 20th may that's tomorrow at 8 pm you can get the link to register on our facebook page 
um, and, and you can register from there if you're interested in that webinar. Thanks all for joining. This was wonderful. Have a Thank good night. Thank you, everybody. All right. Bye, Vishin. I can see you. <laughs>